Hi, everyone here and around the world. Ian reports tonight that since last week's June 29th broadcast, we have had viewers from 56 different countries checking into this Earth Files YouTube channel. And like all of you, I keep wondering when the whole world is going to be told the truth that we are not alone in this universe. Well, this tweet from Elon Musk last week on July 21st, 2022, may be another signal that the truth is coming closer at last. Elon Musk tweeted, quote, honored to meet at Pontifex yesterday, published July 1st at 3.54 a.m. Rome time, showing Musk standing in a black suit next to Pope Francis, all in white near some Vatican visitors. This news has provoked me to wonder if the Musk and Pope meeting is because the United States wants the Vatican to participate in reaching the world public with that revolutionary, we're not alone headline, while Elon Musk is preparing to start taking humans to Mars in 2024. Insiders tell me there are ancient archeological structures beneath the red sands of Gale Crater that is pictured here, that are expected to be revealed as evidence of previous non-human habitations on the red planet. American presidents since Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1933 to 1945, Harry S. Truman from April 12, 1945 to January 20th, 1953, and Dwight David Eisenhower from January 20th, 1953 to January 20th, 1961. These presidents were allegedly shown evidence of advanced ET technologies and non-human bodies from many different crash sites containing various species ranging from reptilian humanoids, tall whites, blonde Nordics, to a variety of gray artificial intelligences and some biologicals, to blue Olmec looking types, to teal blues, to praying mantises, to light beings, to ancient grays. And about the grays, I received the following information after last week's broadcast from my military aerospace source. The photos you will next see are from a confidential source back in 2021. Quote, no gray is gray in color. Even drone engineered grays like this four fingered hand in this photo are pale in color, similar to human skin. And notice the long dark fingernails of this being. Linda, in your book, An Alien Harvest, on page 59, you quote abductee Judy Doherty describing two gray entities that were dissecting tissue from a mutilated calf taken from a pasture outside Houston, Texas, in May of 1973. Quote, Judy wrote, their hands look funny. They have long claw nails, almost like an animal's dark nails and they have large heads. Their bodies are thin. They have a gray body suit on, but I can't see part of their skin. It's pasty looking and thin, like if you would touch it, it might pop, close quote. And then my source explains, quote, what witnesses mistakenly take for a gray's gray color is a special type of nanotechnology of woven material very similar to Kevlar, like a police vest. The suit functions as a type of exoskeleton to supplement the poor muscle mass ratio of these beings. It also has a secondary function of sensory awareness of the environment. It is woven to the being before flight and kept on while out on assignments. AI biological clone grays keep the suit on almost its entire lifespan. The original tall grays use this same nanotechnology for similar reasons, but seldom use it while in space traveling, nor 
did they use it while evolving in their home system of Epsilon Indy due to lower gravity there. The original grays from Epsilon Indy have a very slight tint of orange in their pigmentation. It's very slight, but it is noticeable under the correct lighting conditions. That answers a question that I've had since 2011 when I interviewed a businessman from Dayton, Ohio, and that was for my news website, earthfiles.com. And the story was about his friendship with a retired U.S. Air Force flight surgeon. The flight surgeon told him about a non-human autopsy that he attended in 1947 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And you can see that report right now, tonight, after the show. Part one is up at the top of my earthfiles.com website, and it will be followed and completed by three more reports over this following week. It's really an important insight into the whole, what's becoming clear, like the suits being something that is nanotechnology, and you will read more about that in the Earth Files. Well, at Wright Pat, the beings had four delicate, long tapered fingers that were a very pale complexion, but their body had a gray covering, like a thin leotard that the doctors discovered when they first tried to make a surgical incision in the chest to begin the autopsy. But the scalpel would not cut through what they first thought was thin gray skin. The doctors were stunned to realize that they were encountering a high-tech, protective, full-body, gray-colored suit. The Wright-Patterson doctor in 1947 said that the lenses of the eyes of the entities were very solid, dark, and opaque like the ones in this photo, and that they might actually be able to detect waves or particles beyond the visual spectrum of light perhaps onto the full range of the electromagnetic spectrum, or even more. Those lenses were a two-piece set of dark, black, elliptical eyepieces as thin as skin, meaning what they measured at Wright-Patterson. Quote, it was not anything like a human eye, and it did not even look like a living creature's eye. It was more like an optical instrument and it looked mechanical, close quote. Those are words from the Wright-Patterson 1947 autopsy on a gray being that was retrieved from one of the Roswell region's UFO crashes. And since last week's broadcast about the question, did President Eisenhower have secret Edwards Air Force Base meeting with ETs on February 19, 1954? Well, I talked with Ralph Steiner, who has been a California-based public radio producer and investigative journalist since gra graduating from the California Institute of the Arts in 1972, working for Pacifica Radio Network from 1980 onward. Ralph produced and hosted several award-winning special broadcasts, including the 1995 Edge of Science radios the UFO contact experience. And Ralph interviewed a man whose high-ranking military uncle was directly involved with a UFO landing at Edwards Air Force Base that he referred to as, quote, a missile, close quote. And the date was probably February 19th, 1954. Supporting the claim that a flying saucer supposedly landed at Edwards Air Force Base, and that the incident also involved a visit by the President of the United States. And in 1994, California resident Walden Welsh broke his silence. This is the first time that his testimony has ever been made public. From what he said, Eisenhower and a staff of men went to Edwards Air Force Base for three days and that there was a flying saucer that landed there and they were at Edwards Air Force Base and went aboard it. It was my uncle and a staff of men that guarded the missile. 
and he never went aboard it. But he did see the, I don't know what to call them, creatures or aliens or whatever. He did see them looking through windows, and he described what they look like and said that it had literally changed his whole concept of life. He did not go aboard the missile, but he said Eisenhower did, and staff of men, and it was a period of three days, and it was his duty to be in charge of guarding it, because he was a top military official, and it was a top secret sort of thing, and I remember him telling the family about it. And something about that the creatures were kind of large eyes and gray colored with blue uniforms and caps on and that they would look through windows and he would see them and the men through windows but he was never admitted aboard he did i believe say how many people went aboard that with eisenhower it was only like maybe two maybe three it was a small group of people that were allowed on it the testimony provided by Walden Welsh seems to suggest that perhaps his uncle participated in a second landing event, one involving the extraterrestrial group known today as the Greys. Early stories describe a UFO landing where a human-appearing group first approached the military, offering help and spiritual guidance, providing our government give up its nuclear weapons. But that offer was supposedly rejected by the Eisenhower administration in favor of a liaison with another group that were willing to cut a deal with humans in exchange for some of their advanced technology. If this scenario is accurate, human history may have dramatically changed course in early 1954, and we've been living with the consequences ever since. And after last week's June 29th broadcast, I also received these comments from my military aerospace source, quote, July 1st, 2022. Linda, I watched your June 29th Earth Files broadcast and can say firmly that the 1954 Eisenhower meeting was a real event. The off-world species was a Nordic delegation of five Nordic individuals that had met our military prior in an incident that occurred near the Canadian border. It was due to the Canadian border incident that led to our military setting up a meeting with President Eisenhower. The same five Nordic individuals that met our military by the Canadian border were the same that met President Eisenhower on the first meeting at Holloman Air Force Base. There were actually three separate meetings that took place. At the second and third meetings, an off-world delegation of four Nordic and three beings from the Sirius stellar system were there as well. It was explained and shown to President Eisenhower the dangers that occur in the quantum field of this universe when a nuclear weapon is exploded. It was agreed that no nuclear weapons would be used in space, close quote. I was told in December of 1999 by the DIA analyst that I've told you about before that nuclear explosions can tear into dimensions that we know nothing about and that allegedly the Nordic ETs showed definitely that they will not allow nuclear weapons to be used in space. My military aerospace source told me that during his aerospace career, when he was directing an aerospace tracking and surveillance system, that that's when he received, quote, the deeper picture through briefings about off-world agreements and the prohibited use of nuclear weapons in space. I can't say it any more directly than that. That is exactly how I started understanding the big picture and just how involved our government and military are with off-world, real, intelligent beings. When I became a senior director, I received my highest classified security clearance, and at that point, I was briefed almost weekly, mainly by DIA analysts, the Defense Intelligence Agency, 
on the different programs involving these other off-world groups. It was during this time in my career that I was introduced to the Tall Pale Whites in a program that my company managed. The Eisenhower meetings did occur. And in totality, there were three separate landings meetings directly with President Eisenhower and a small entourage of selected individuals. I did read in that briefing that there were two religious leader types, a bishop and a well-known cardinal that is likely California Cardinal James Francis McIntyre. They were present at the first of a second meeting, but not at the third meeting. There was mostly military intelligence officers present and some medical staff. The information from the DIA briefing did not give any dates of these meetings, but only referred to a classified landing zone at Holloman Air Force Base that was maintained by the Army Rangers in 1954. As an aside, that might explain why there are historic references to meetings at both Edwards Air Force Base in California and Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. As I mentioned in previous emails, the elimination of the Trontoloid insect species has the highest priority among classified programs. The Trontoloids are the ETs from Epsilon Eridani about 10 and a half light years from here, with advanced temporal technology. They can manipulate time. DIA is the agency that is tasked with the dissemination of any information concerning the Tronoloid issue to other interagency groups. It was only through crash retrievals and other military intelligence operations that we ourselves and our military learned of temporal technology and the dangers of it. We as Earth humans do not ourselves possess any technology that we ourselves could prevent or counter any temporal technology used against us in a large scale operation. The Epsilon Eridani insect species is the same group that was referred to in the March 1981 DIA report for President Ronald Reagan. The names of the tronoloids, archaloids, quadloids, heptaloids were given by the late NASA Goddard biochemist Emmett Chappelle. We humans are being managed and protected by the three ET species called the tall pale whites, the blonde Nordics, and the original orange-hued grays. These three groups far surpass us in evolutionary biology age by about 1.7 billion years collectively as a group. That means they are that much older as groups than Homo sapiens. Those three ET groups have helped our military intelligence and our government to understand that the tronoloid temporal technology is a threat to everyone living on Earth and probably beyond, and to understand the resources and commitment it will take to eliminate that threat. But just know that the human race is moving on an evolutionary scale very quickly to understanding the phenomena of higher dimensions and a conscious universe, and that the two are inseparable. And he added these important words. Quote, the one thing I do know is the fact that the universe is filled with very intelligent life and that reality can be altered along with yourself as well by conscious intent. Close quote. And we can't have conscious intent unless we are well educated about everything that is going on in this universe, that it shouldn't be segmented and faceted and hidden, that humans might truly evolve and grow faster if we knew. So on that note, what I'd like to do is go to Ian for beginning comments and questions. 
and I would very much like to hear back from you guys tonight on whether you feel that this is the kind of information, what I've just done, is the kind of information that everybody should be getting around the world and that it doesn't leave me afraid. But I would like to know, because governments always say, well, we can't tell the people because everybody will panic. And I think that is an old Rubik. I think this is exactly this and a thousand more pages of truth. This is what we need now in this difficult decade. I hope you agree, but I would like to hear from you. Okay, Ian. Thank you, Linda. Well, we've got viewers tuning in from all around the world again this evening. Last right. week, we had viewers from 56 different countries. This week, we've got viewers coming in from the Philippines, Greece, Kazakhstan, Brazil, Peru, Macedonia, Sweden, just to name a few. So thank you, everyone. Hi, you guys from everywhere. I'm so happy that we are beginning to have more and more global expansion. Thank you, everyone. And what have we got for comments and questions? Well, straight off, we've got a comment from uh, NY Native 61 says, my co-worker was stationed at Wright Patterson 20 years ago. I asked her if what I'd heard about what uh, Wright Patterson is true. Without me explaining what I meant, she said, about the aliens and ships, oh yes, all true. Underground at Wright Patterson. <laughs> yeah, they probably have uh, hundreds of square acres underground filled with stuff. And uh, it, it's how do we get past uh, all of the, uh, the guardrails and actually start learning facts? I hope that a show like this one tonight and the ones that I have been doing, I hope that they're contributing to at least opening up and leaving people as I feel. I am so curious. I could be reading a thousand pages every day if I could keep learning about everything I have been exposed to. And I would imagine a lot of you feel the same way. So, okay, Ian, what have we got up for questions and comments? Well, uh, there was speculation going as you were uh, in, in your report. People were saying, does everybody, uh, can everybody tell if the greys are an actual real alien race that came alive by natural evolution or were they created by another species? And uh, Furthermore, are the Nordics and tall whites different? I've listened to and read contradictory information. I guess you answered some of that in your report as it unfolded. I am going to try uh, to do updates like I did a little bit on the greys tonight. I'm going to try to gain more information about the tall whites and the Nordics. And uh, I think that the issue of very ancient pasts and even wars are part of the backstory that might affect which ones are now currently in what solar systems. Like when I show uh, you the star map that I have been making and evolving, there is a note about how there were uh, at Rigel, uh, some people say Rigel, 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 that there w was a war between some Nordics and some reptilians, and that the Nordics left there and reptilians came in, but the Nordics moved on to places like Procyon A and B and Sirius. And so there's, you get the impression that uh, we have only, um, what, 45,000 years as a quote unquote stand up manipulated species. Uh, that the DIA guy said that three groups were competing over Earth 270 million years ago, uh, that we're in a 13.8 billion light year universe, and that what we are missing in our knowledge is we don't know anything about w what all has churned in this galaxy and the three trillion other galaxies of this universe uh, that might affect a geopolitical if you knew all the geopolitical landscape, that it might begin to explain why the Nordics are where they are, the tall whites at 82, uh, G82 Eridani, um, and they don't seem to move around. Others move around a lot. And 
this to me is like the beginning of uh, chapters that you could start taking a university course uh, that would go on for years about what has actually happened in this solar system alone, let alone all of theirs. But what is the true origin point of each of these beings? And since the greys, everybody says the greys are largely artificial intelligence, but that there was this original gray that has the orange uh, hue on the skin and that they are still there, but that they go back maybe uh, 1.8, 2 billion years. So it is a, uh, wouldn't you say, Ian, it is a gigantic uh, puzzle that you could start filling walls and walls for acres as we learned. It's that, it's so huge. Well, as you say, it's very complex. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, well, people are also uh, sending in their own reports about their own experiences. We've got one here from uh, Zach Stockdale who says, I'm a former army ranger living here in Costa Rica. Here on the beach, there was a UAP sighting and people took photos from multiple angles over a period of 40 minutes or so. Does he have an illustration, a photo? Uh, what type of uh, craft are we talking about? And is he still there that you can ask him uh, to tell us? I guess he is, and uh, if you could give us more information or write yeah. to us directly by email at earthfiles at earthfiles.com, we'd be pleased to hear, especially if you've got some of those photographs. Yes, absolutely, but it also underscores, we only get what comes through our, here, it would be American press, you it would be the UK press. While events are happening in many countries around the world, a lot of the time that nobody is hearing about. Linda, you asked what people thought about the, uh, about the show. People are saying, um, we all love your interesting show. Thank you for your hard work. That comes from Blue Sky. She says it's important for all of us. Okay. Sharon Lee says this is the information we all need. It does not scare me at all. And Frances Palmer from the UK says these streams just get juicier and juicier. Well oh, done. Good, good. Yeah, that, I think this is exactly the attitude we all need is to be really curious and learn as much as possible, and know that there are very smart people who are trying to work with tall whites and Nordics, and maybe even the tall greys, on how to solve this trontoloid insect issue that isn't just the Earth's problem, it's many problems, and that it's been said to me by another source that the tall whites actually do have the kind of technology that can counter. We don't. And this is part of what, uh, in a way, it's, it's humbling to realize that in and out of World War II and since World War II, that human governments exposed to an evolving story about extraterrestrials interacting with the Earth, the Moon, the solar system and beyond, that they would be so uh, on edge, you can begin to see why they thought nobody can know this, we'll have global panic. But it has taken uh, the 20th to the 21st century into this rough decade of 2020 to 2030, where I think that we are all more immune from fear, fear, and that there is a sense of everyone wanting to get past all of the shootings and the Ukraine war, and that this wearying exhaustion time of so many problems, and that the idea that we're going to have people starting to go to Mars, there will hopefully, with the help of these advanced beings who want to see us survive, as, as I understand it, even if they can't, come, they can't come in and live life for us. And there's the balance. There's the, the razor's edge. But to, to get to a point where we could interact telepathically, verbally, screens, whatever it is, with 
beings that, as that one man said, it was like uh, standing next to a, a person who had five crays for a brain. They were talking about the tall whites. I find that would be exciting if, if it would be possible to learn and communicate with that, that level. They might be bored as can be from us, but nevertheless, don't you feel that we are, in spite of all of the problems on the planet, doesn't it feel like there's something like a frequency, a vibration that is trying to break through that would be the revolution and we would no longer be just earth bound in our minds or even in our ability to live if all goes well with the Mars mission. So I find that, and I hope you share this, I'm going to try to keep reporting as much as I can that I think is close to truths. Uh, I try really hard to weed out as much as I can in terms of classic jur journalism approach. But that if we can get to a point where there's no longer sarcasm about even talking about other life in the universe, and we actually start becoming a planet that is learning together, it might solve some of the problems. So that's my hope, that we can become learners together about everything around us in the solar system and beyond. I find it exciting. Okay, Ian, what else? Zach Stockdale in uh, Costa Rica says he will email you copies of the photos, so he has responded. Great. Uh, did he say what the shape is? Uh, no, he didn't, but the chat's moving so fast. We've got okay. a lot of questions coming All in. All right, so that I, go, go for it. We'll wait for his email and see what, what, yeah. uh, what that brings forward. Uh, we've also got people uh, commenting on their own experiences. Barbara Dullum says she didn't get abducted, well, as far as she knows, but I saw what had what had to have been a Nordic toddler. I see that your representation of these comes from somebody uh, somebody in her hometown. Oh, Lisa Duesenberry, the, the, who sketched the uh, Nordic? I think she's recognised who she is. Um, we've also got Sarah Keller says, um, I always wondered why the aliens that took me looked light orange copper coloured. They didn't have a grey suit on. I could see them in my mind. As soon as I saw the picture, my ear started buzzing. Yes, and I have a, a watercolor that a woman in Denver made. And it, she said, she was almost apologetic. She said, I know it looks so orange. And it, she put it at the window where she saw it. But she said, honestly, it isn't the watercolor. That's the color it was. Well, it was quite orange. But my source has stressed that it has to do with the light frequencies that are uh, that the skin is exposed to. It might be very subtle under some, and it might not be quite as subtle. But it would begin to add some uh, more detail to these what were considered to be outlier illustrations back in the uh, early 80s when I was starting to gather from abductees, so many uh, illustrations, that the orange, which is, has come up now, I think, just as you just uh, said, Ian, and as uh, we're reporting tonight, it is related to part of the gray, huge menagerie of beings. Go ahead. Hey, we, yep. Linda, I've got some questions here. Sexy Sadie says, you mentioned our local area of the Milky Way is about 200 light years. Have you heard about any species originating from farther away or possibly other galaxies? No one has talked to me yet about anything related to solar system evolutions out beyond what I'm showing in my star map. Uh, I, I'm going to continue to keep adding the more I learn. And the so... so uh, in the discussions that I have had with more, probably five, I think it's almost half a dozen people 
who have knowledge either through science, through medicine, or through military, or a combination. I get the sense that there is a, like, our government is operating from, if you put uh, a, a pin in uh, the earth at the five-sided building in Washington, D.C., and th that's your zero point, and if you then go out 100, 150, 200 light years, I think they do gr grids that way. You make the circle around the Pentagon, so to speak, that part of this cataloging, the cataloging, uh, I had reported 22. Uh, I have some new information that the cataloging that we have been doing with the help of the tall whites and the Nordics may be now up to 28 and that we are in the process of learning how to do uh, the uh, deep probe tunneling, quantum tunneling, and that that can take us, and then it's increments of light years in, say, an Earth day, and, and that they really have a lot of information out that far, 100, 150, 200 light years, of everything that goes around. And you think about the density of information that that would constitute, it's probably the tall whites and the Nordics who have the ability to store all the information so that we then are somehow interacting as this newly alive planet that is joining or they are helping us, uh, whatever the combination is. but. Uh, that's the size, Ian, as I understand it, that if you look down on, from here down, then out 100, 150, 200 light years in a circle. Okay, Linda, here we go. Did the friendly ETs offer a method of defense against the Trantaloids? I have not heard a description of what, quote unquote, an invasion or a fighting or a war with the Trinoloids would be. What we have all heard together was uh, Buddy Bolton's very good uh, remote viewing deep dive into the Trinoloids uh, with his uh, fascinating illustrations. That is a program back about three months ago, for those of you who want to do a search. And it really is worth going back and looking at that program because one of the things that has been uh, kind of uh, almost like a revelation, Buddy, on the first phone call when he had done remote viewing and he had sent illustrations, the beings were all strange colors, which you can see in, in our show. The, the, all of the illustrations he did are there. But red, blue, purple, green, orange, all these strange colors. And it just, it almost seemed, I don't know, it, 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 what is this? And then Buddy said that it had to do with frequencies, that the Tronaloids use frequencies to create different surfaces in which they can then uh, pretend to be whatever it is that they are projecting like a hollow form that would keep them invisible or make them look like uh, a bush or whatever it is that they have decided on the planet that they're going to go to, that this is how they're going to hide. And, it ha and so Buddy's drawings and his remote viewing was going to right to the heart of one of the abilities of the Tronaloids, which is to be able to use frequencies that translate in different color reflections and frequencies, very complex patterns, and they can disappear or they can appear as uh, something around us, and that we are trying the, the United States and apparently others, we are also trying to learn from that. And the, uh, I know that the uh, biochemist 
who I talked about, uh, uh, Professor Chappelle, who had the names for the tronaloids and the quadloids and the archaloids and the, the loids in the Reagan presentation, that he, before he died, he had uh, filed for a patent that had to do with how frequencies could be used to pattern over and be used technologically. So it seemed to me two plus two equals four that he was, uh, he was patenting information that perhaps he was learning in our government's efforts to uh, better understand the tronaloids with the help of the uh, tall whites and the Nordics uh, and probably the tall grays. So the tronaloids, bottom line, uh, Buddy Bolton got that they are uh, extremely advanced and from their point of view, anything that is in their way, they have a right to use. But on the other hand, in that process, and they expand quickly, whether they do it with uh, warring intent or not, that they can become a serious problem to other planets if they just keep marching their populations and taking planets as if they have this right to. And that, as far as I'm concerned, from everything that I have uh, learned, the tall whites have the technology to counter them. So, sleep well tonight <laughs> with those words till we learn more. <laughs> Linda, it's funny you should end on that because we've got some more comments coming in. Darcy Austin says, Linda, your info gives such a general feeling of comfort that we are all in connect interconnected on some Good. level. Good. And uh, Preston C. Copeland says, always the best content, 100% awesome. Thank you. I just feel like we should be as honest as possible about all of it. And it will become less and less scary and more and more interesting. And that is a great combination. Yeah, go ahead, Ian. Ask everybody to like and subscribe. We're just under 213,000 subscribers at the moment. Oh, great. Yeah, we we'll, we'll break through 213 for, by next week. Oh, yeah, the, the red button or red rectangle or whatever it is in the lower right corner to subscribe. And uh, the likes, if you like uh, the Earth Files YouTube channel, uh, let us know. Yes, a red uh, triangle on its side. Okay, we've got the super chats to deal with now. We've got uh, Moonbird. Hi, Kathy. Moonbird. <laughs> Kathy Owonski. Uh, she says, looking forward to another awesome evening listening to you, Linda, from Aurora, Colorado. Patricia O'Neill, Jessica Rodriguez in Massachusetts. She says, the hard work you've been doing is amazing and you really are the light people need to hear light people need to hear the truth thank you anna kajula says we need your work in the world more than ever linda thank you for your hard work in the greatest cause there is and obi-wan sends a heart and a thumbs up to you thank you thank you so much okay we've got some more questions here angie m says linda is there any information on what they found when they did the autopsies meaning inside their bodies I have seen um, what I think were real autopsy reports and, and some of the material, well, I'll just say overall, they're not opening up and seeing inside a body that is anything like humans. They're very different. <laughs> the organs are very different. Remember that there was one <laughs> autopsy that seemed to suggest, and it was, I think it was in the 40s vintage, that the being was some kind of a hybrid. And back then, I can see that medically, if doctors were doing autopsies and they were finding that the being was, had some 
homo sapien and some something else. That would probably have been terrifying to political and military people at the time. And that that information was probably stamped at the highest magic and don't tell anybody and, and all of that that has evolved up to today. But the bigger picture now, my curiosity is, what is it in the more ancient greys that seem to be looked at by my uh, aerospace military source and a few others that the tall ancient greys don't mean us harm, but the greys are the ones that are associated with more than just about anything else with extracting the blood and the tissues from animal mutilations and uh, doing abductions in which at least the, the abductee gets the impression that they're being harvested for sperm or for eggs for a hybrid. And this is why I think the material is so difficult uh, to penetrate and to make sense of because so much of it is denied. And therefore, it is very, very dangerous for me or for anybody to say, I, I read this autopsy report and it said X and the date was uh, 1951. Because in 1951, I don't think there was, they, had, they knew a lot, but they, they didn't have perspective like what I think we have more today. So what is the reason for the hybridization with Homo sapien on Earth? And from there going back, how many types of ETs have been on the planet going back 270 million or more? And why have we been in a civilization that seems to sort of start the history of everything in the Garden of Eden, where vipers, as they're labeled in Genesis, vipers are the teachers to the first man and woman. Well, that might be an insight into something that could be true. It might be true that the first evolutionary life form that stuck and really grew and evolved on this particular planet, perhaps planted by others in the universe, were reptiles. That is a possibility. And therefore, all of these, like Genesis and discussions about wars between reptiles and other species because the reptiles claim Earth as theirs and they want everybody else to leave. And other, others argue uh, that they have a right to explore. All of that is kind of the booming chaos when you try to look back, where is the beginning of where humans actually start and what was here and what was manipulating, why, and what have they gotten from it and what more would they gain going forward in the future from here? Uh, one very interesting news story recently is that there is this asteroid out in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And it is supposed to be full of gold and very rare metals. And the, the headline said something like estimated to be worth $18 trillion or some mind-blowing number. And, and then couple that with why would various civilizations be based around certain planets, certain solar systems, certain parts of this little tiny arm of the Milky Way galaxy with this huge galaxy? 
everybody with computers needs a lot of rare metals and probably the, what drew some of the beings would be for gold and for all the things that actually are valuable anywhere you are in the universe. And that kind of lens makes me just want to know more and more and more because there have to be grids of knowledge, grids of historic insights about why things are the way they are now based on 1.8 billion year old, say, the tall grays. If, if they've been here that long, boy, what they know. But they appear to have a real survival problem in and of their biology. And, and that seems to be a serious issue. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's why they're involved with hybridization. Not for anything insidious, but that they are so old and that they want to continue evolving like everybody else does. And they have to do it through hybridization of other life forms on other planets where they want to explore. These are not hard facts. These are the kinds of speculations that my mind and other minds go when you start thinking about the, the history that has been left in our hands through biblical literature and other versus what we are beginning to learn through sophisticated science and hopefully, hopefully the Webb telescope is going to aim at those frequencies like looking for artificial light, maybe at the Trappist one, uh, maybe in the Proxima, and that they're, uh, if, if, if they could use the Webb telescope this year to simply confirm is there na uh, artificial light on a planet around X, Y, or Z sun, the artificial light would be one of those factors on a list having to do with looking honestly for other life and other intelligence. And all of that is coming at us in this year. It's going to keep accelerating. And Earth Files, YouTube channel, I keep trying to stay up with what is breaking news. Okay, Ian. Hey, Linda. Yeah. I'm here. I can hear you. Are you there? <laughs> so we want to communicate with the universe, but we have a hard time communicating between the United States and England. <laughs> I don't know what happened to Ian. Um, I don't know what to do. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, Brad, do you have any way of hearing uh, or seeing what people are doing? Yeah, I'm back. Okay. What is it, I okay. wonder? No, I don't know what happened there, but, but I just I just logged out, logged back in again, and I'm back again. All right. Anyway, we've got some more people who are sharing their own personal experiences. Good. So uh, here's some that, uh, that they're recognizing from your presentation. Barbara Dullum says, now I'm certain that the nano lens research I found at Duke and MIT is modeled after the ETI, which had a type of skin as a lens. She also says that she saw the toddler in 2015 in the spring on a bright morning. She was only two feet away from his face and saw the Nordic eye with an upright rectangular pupil. Yes, I, this is so good. Um, can you ask for more information? I would love uh, to do a segment about this because I'm convinced that we have all kinds of breakthroughs in technology that have come directly from our work with the tall whites and the Nordics. Yes, Barbara, if you're listening, please contact us yeah. at earthfiles.com. Yeah. Okay, we've got Sarah Keller. She also says they kept contacting me through other means. I'm sure it was them. They came as orange light bodies and warned me of danger. They came as holographic triangles that shape shifted into different things. And the orange, um, does she describe or has she drawn? The orange should be sort of subtle 
um, it would be very interesting to see how she would draw and what color orange she would use. Ask if she could send me that. An illustration with the orange that's very close to what she remembers. Are we losing Ian again? <laughs> a one it's, good if, it's always good if people can provide their own sketches as well, as sometimes to yeah. shade them in or color them in pastels or whatever when they send information to yeah. us. Yes, and seeing the colors as close to what you see in your mind's eye is very, very valuable. So uh, I hope you will send illustrations colored. Thank you. Okay, Linda, do the aliens or ETs know the concepts of demons? Are they also afraid of them? Remember, uh, going all the way back, what, four years ago, uh, when we started uh, the Earth Files YouTube channel, and I told uh, the story about the government agent all the way back in 1983 when I was working on the home box office, uh, trying to get that documentary produced with the government putting stumbling blocks in every direction I was going. But that I was able to talk with a man in Washington, D.C., because I was back there working on a documentary for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in the chemistry series that they were doing around 1983 to 84. And... Uh, so I was working in science and traveling and, and all of that, and I got to meet um, a particular individual who was a scientist, a bona fide scientist. But in the work that we were doing for the chemistry show, I also was being asked questions by people who knew about my documentary, A Strange Harvest, uh, animal mutilations, UFOs, ETs, that subject was going with me where I went and people were asking questions. And that's how I came to learn that this scientist that I met when I was working in, on the chemistry sh show knew a great deal about extraterrestrial biological entities. And in one um, discussion, he told me that he knew who uh, was MJ-8 in the Majestic 12 that Truman had appointed in 47. This was in 19, I think it was 84 by then, I think is when this discussion took place. And that he had been exposed through one of the MJ-12s to a concept that the ETs had somehow informed us that surrounding what we'll call the matter universe was a cold, dark sea. Those are the words, cold, dark sea. And when I asked him, well, what is the cold, dark sea? He said, I asked the same question. And he said, MJ-8 said, you don't want to know. I said, yes, I do want to know. What is the cold, dark sea? And then MJ-8 looked at him again and said, you don't want to know, and stressed it. Okay, two years ago, I gave that issue to Buddy Bolton, asked him, can you try to re remote, re uh, remote view what could be in the category of a cold, dark sea having to do with this universe. We have never done a full program on that because it was confusing to some extent to Buddy. He got impressions of things. But if you said, what did it all boil down to? It is as if there is an insight that this entire universe was made for the pulse of the yin and yang, that there is something about the very existence of this universe that is tied into issues about the light versus the dark the yin versus the yang. 
and that the cold, dark sea is something that is fundamental and there at all times in relationship to this particular universe. But to go to exactly what it is, where did it come from, why would it surround the universe, all of these existential and spiritual questions that are fascinating to contemplate, no real hard answers. But I think one of the closest is, is this universe that may be a hologram projected, and now information that may be projected from the constellation Lyra direction, meaning that there's even a direction to what might be a projection of the universe. Would it be like Jerry Wills who went to Peru and did the sounds and went through that stone wall and went off in some kind of a transparent bubble and ended up in this all white place and a voice uh, that he talked with and, and when the voice asked him where he was from, as if it was nothing for him to show up inside of wherever this white space was, and Jerry said, Earth, the voice sounded almost sardonic as it said, Oh, Earth. And sometimes, I sometimes wonder, are we in this huge cosmic school that the physicist Thomas Campbell says that he thinks that what we're in is an entropy reduction trainer for souls. If that were true, it might explain some of the juxtapositions that seem so theatrical, the dark versus the white constantly butting up against each other, a cold, dark sea surrounding, a cold, dark sea of H2O, no but something that has temperature and maybe mass and something that surrounds a universe that is always in conflict with the universe, is always determining what is going to happen inside of the universe until the souls and the consciousnesses of intelligence learn how to get rid of the cold dark sea, and then would the entire universe transition all to light? Something around that complexity, I personally think is at work, which makes me just want to learn everything more, all I can. I'd like to go on forever studying, going everywhere, understanding all of it. There's nothing more fascinating than the planet we're on in the universe that we're in. And maybe there are an infinite number of universes. And the human mind begins to go, I can't go, it's too much, I can't go there. But the universe, the cosmos, it is what it is. And Roger Penrose, Nobel Prize winner, his book, Cycles of Time, just like David Bohm talks about all mass is frozen light, Roger Penrose did a this magnificent book that everything is in cycles of time and that from his point of view, when I interviewed him, there was no beginning of a singularity everything, cycles of infinity, incomprehensible to the human mind. But maybe that's what we're in. And that Thomas Campbell is right. We're in it because it's an entropy reduction trainer for souls. Entropy is any energy it is going down, the opposite of light. So a entropy reduction trainer 
as he says. You, if you feel love, if you think light, all of that counters the entropy. And tonight I will leave us on what I think is probably one of the more important pieces that I am now getting from several different sources and I'm trying to understand more and then I'll do a report. The universe itself is conscious and that in that fact how our brains, our nerves are made to interact with the frequencies of this entire universe may also be one of the huge keys that not all humans have been taught. But if all humans were taught how to interact with the universe, when he said, the one thing I do know is the fact that the universe is filled with very intelligent life and that reality can be altered along with yourself as well by conscious intent. Conscious intent, working in a conscious universe. It may be that the future will hold for humans because we will learn how to image in our minds, reflecting our souls, things that are positive and filled with light and love and anti-entropy and that this universe can react if we as a planetary species can shift the frequencies that are so jumbled and chaotic and dis dis well destructive to the opposite we might end up truly evolving into heaven on earth it's been said before it may be what is out in the future and that's why continuing to come on Wednesday nights, have these dialogues with each other, that words matter, thoughts matter, frequencies matter. We can help each of us be anti-entropy reduction trainers for our souls. I love you guys. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions have, will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>